What a great intro. That yeah, was awesome. That was, was amazing. We've got some real winners there. <laughs> <There's>, uh, <laughs> welcome to our Disney Movie Club. How's that? How's uh, let's talk about Christmas Carol and uh <laughs> No, but I mean I've you know, that's the first time this is the first time we've had our own special intro for Laughing Place Movie Club. So mm-hmm. that was cool. Um, well, that was the, the movie, previous really 30 entries of the movie club as of when I made that video, which was like a month ago. But cool. uh, we'll have to have them updated on like a semi regular. <laughs> Remember basis. that train tour for, for Christmas, Christmas Carol? Carol? Yeah. That was, <laughs> we talked that was, about that. That was my one and only time in Miami. No, <laughs> yeah. you have been to Miami at least two other times, just not to see Miami. When did I also go in Miami? We have departed from two Disney cruises out of Miami. Oh, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess, but that's not like. You Miami. saw as much of it as we did on the train tour. Bienvenidos, <laughs> indeed. Bienvenidos. No, we, we made that wrong turn and we ended up in a part of Miami I did not need before, to be. Before we confuse everybody and lose our whole entire audience, um, <laughs> this is Laughing Place Movie Club. Welcome. Um, and today we're talking about Derek Delgadio's In and of Itself, which is on Hulu. I'm Alex. Above me, we've got Ben. <laughs> we've got Mike Celestino. And we've got Lee joining us for his very first movie Wait, club. I, I should have done the, I should have had cards ready to go and done the, the thing. Can you do that? Are you that? No, you that uh, cool? not at all. Oh, okay. I, I have not, no dexterity at all. <laughs> I can barely shuffle a deck of cards. So what Derek does with his fingers is. I, I mean, am. Yeah, that's Benji's. You're really good at cards, Lee? No. no okay. I just wanted to say I am. So um, for anybody watching, we are live at the moment, as long as you see that live button. Um, if you have a comment stream that you can chat in, you're free to uh, message us. We can display your comment, or you can ask uh, questions or things you want us to talk about about the film in and of itself. And we will um, join that conversation. Um, but for uh, for Mike and Lee, this was your first time um, getting to experience the show. Um, what were your thoughts what were you expecting versus what did you receive uh Want to go first mike sure yeah uh i knew very little about this going in i knew frank oz had directed it because i saw him talking about it on twitter like two three years ago when the show was running um i didn't i actually didn't know it involved magic at all um going into it which is a, a wonderful surprise i didn't i didn't read anything about it I just watched it, which is, I think, the best way to do it. In fact, um, you know, I'll say I thought it was fantastic. I loved it. Uh, I was really moved by it, and I it, it appealed to me for a number of reasons that we'll get into. But it, this is one of those things where I watched it and I immediately like texted a handful of people that I knew would love it as well. And I was like, when you watch it, don't read anything about it before you watch it because that's the best way to do it. And and I love how it unfolded. I loved how it ended um what was the question <laughs> that was, i mean that that answered it it was yeah yeah was, uh, um, what did you know about it and what did you receive from it like the difference between those two right and oh i have i have several questions for you guys now knowing that you saw the live show i wish i really wish that i had seen it in person in, in new york I, I think it would have been an amazing experience but i i, I do have yeah. questions about that can, as, can as i we just, go on. can i just jump in and say how we ended up seeing it um, uh, before, can we get can we get Lee's sure question, and then you can share? Yeah, let me talk. Story. Come on, <laughs> um, <laughs> go for it. Uh, so, just like Mike, I heard first about the show from Frank Oz talking about it on Twitter every like five minutes, um, to the point where I was like, "Okay, Frank, like, come on, I know all about this show now." Well, can I ask you a question, Lee? Yeah. When you read Frank Oz's tweets, which Muppet? Do you read that voice? Do you read it in? Does it always sound like Yoda. Miss Piggy or Yoda? Okay. It's always Yoda. Yeah. <laughs> but now maybe I'll picture Miss Piggy and the voice. <laughs> but yeah, he would talk about it nonstop. So it was always in my mind that, you know, if I go to New York, I may need to see this show because it sounds really interesting. Um, so it's always been in the back of my head. And then that trailer came out from Hulu that it was going to be appearing on the service. And I was like, oh my gosh, here we go. Like, I get to see it now. Um, so I was very excited. I had no idea what it was about. Um, however, I did know that there was going to be a little bit of magic. And I don't know if that's because I knew about, I think his name is Derek. Mm-hmm. That's the show. Yep. So I guess I knew a little bit about him because for some reason I did know that there was going to be magic in there. 
Um, but other than that, sorry, you can always ahead. say the rule of Tista. Really yes. Nice. <laughs> um, so uh, can I bring up a, a point here at the beginning that it says on his Wikipedia or whatever that he was the artist in residence at Walt Disney Imagineering. Do you huh. know anything more about that or, or what that means to have an artist in residence? They will bring in. Um, I, I hate to say artists, but, you know, particularly like visual, like uh, interactive artists, like illusionists and things like that to help develop the sort of next generation of um, magic in the parks and special effects. So there's been, you know, there's, there's a lot of magicians who consult with Imagineering or illusionists, whatever the PC term is. Um, And, um, you know, so I I don't know, you know, I don't know that that was necessarily what was doing, but that's when I've heard that term before was, you know, someone who, um, Imagineering brings in to brainstorm, develop, not so much being an Imagineer, but more of like a, a consultant. Interesting. Maybe he maybe he helped with the illusion of of uh, the pre-show for Rise of the Resistance, where you've got like Ray and you'd never see a projector. Cause there's there's crazy stuff in the show, but then you wanted to tell the story of how we ended up at the show. Yeah, um, so it, as you could probably, if you saw the movie, you could probably tell it takes place in a very small theater off Broadway. Um, I, you know, I don't, it, 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 like my high school gym, you know, theater was like ten times as big as this, and it's a black um, box style. Yeah. So, and we were leaving New York. We were leaving Toy Fair one year, and I forget what we were talking about earlier. But Alex really wanted to see a particular show and like go to New York to see it, and. You know, we, we couldn't see it that trip, so we had a, So I was like thinking, okay, we'll plan another trip. And I opened up Sky Magazine on my Delta flight, and it talks about how they extended this show, and it was directed by Frank Oz and produced by Neil Patrick Harris. And you know, it it it, va- it, it talked about magic a little bit, but it talked about how it was like high concept. And me and high concept don't always get along very well. But I was like, okay, you know. So I, I'm sitting there on the plane, and the and the tickets were. Not you know for theater it was relatively inexpensive. So I just hey, I, can I can I pause yeah. there for a second? How is this high concept? Because to me, high con the definition of high concept is you know the elevator pitch. Like here's what this is, and I I couldn't tell you what this is even having seen it. Like <laughs> I think they were trying to convey it's not just illusion for illusion sake. It's story with illusion as opposed to a magic show where they make it and then they fluff it up with other things. It's not, a, I mean, you know, calling it a magic show would give you the completely wrong right. vibe. I think that was yeah. their way of saying, you know, I, I think they, because the concept that they talked about, and I, I don't even know that I could eloquently say it, but it was like, you know, talking about identity, which is obviously a huge part of the movie. That's what they really stressed to in the little sky. You know, I mean, you're literally talking like this, but a sky mile little blurb. You know, talk about you know uses mat uses illusion to convey, um, you know, a, the concept of identity and what it means. Okay. And so that translated to because we communicate so well, Benji and I. That translated to you know one of the nights of our New York trip, we're going to see this show off Broadway. It's it's you know a twenty minute walk from from Times Square. It was and, more than uh, minutes. <laughs> it, was, it was like, it was a long walk both ways. We did where, get- where was the theater? Can I ask? You know the city better than I, Benji. Can you- No, I mean, it was, it was sort of, it was sort of like downtown, like it was further, you know, south. <laughs> like I'm trying to, you know, it was, I, I couldn't tell you where it was, but it, it took us a good 40 minutes to walk there from Times Square. Wow. And it's in a building, it's in a building. Um, it was like the sub level. Right, yeah, it's like it's like a bank of building, like a, bank. Like a sub level, yeah. yeah. Okay. And then that sub level had a sub level where they set up like a weird little speakeasy. So like before you could get into the theater if you got there too early, which we did. Um, it was like hang out, drink, and they their little merch booth sold like a magnet, and that was it. That was like the in and of itself merch. That's really cool though that it had speakeasy. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, which so, is literally like this like one guy bartender like. There was no like staff, right? It was just like a guy who like probably has like eighteen jobs, and he would just go there and do this, and <laughs> you know, like did his own stock. He was talking because there's probably only four people that bought a drink that whole time because 
it's not that many people that go see the show. And then, you know, a lot of people went in and get, because, you know, part of the experience is going in and experience, you know, and the interactive element. So it's not like you, right. you're going to go there, you know, there's no intermission. And so, you know, you kind of want to get in the theater and see the setup. And so it was not a popular thing, but it was, and it was all set up with like black, like Dubatine. So there's like, like to get to the bathroom, like you kind of had to go like around the curtain because yeah. like, it wasn't really meant to be like a theater like that. It was, it was interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well now my next question for you guys who went to the show, which cards did you both pick? Yeah. I had, I had deliberated, but I'm a huge, I'm a huge wizard of Oz fan. Wicked is my favorite show. And they had next to each other, I'm a good witch and I'm a bad witch. And so I grabbed one <laughs> good witch, um, you know, just just as just to be like silly. Yeah. But I was properly embarrassed when he called, when he asked for the good witch to stand so, up. Oh, so you got <laughs> some interaction in there. I yeah, it makes my heart my heart race. Um, thinking about <laughs> it. But before I get to that, Benji, do you want to say what you? I can't remember for the life of me. Like, I thought I maybe Dog Lover. I might have picked Dog Lover. I remember not caring. Like, <laughs> like there was all these people there, like wanting to take yeah. a card, and so it's like, it's nice like, it's like I just want to take the card and get to my seat. So it was like it wasn't my. I picked all the ones there. I was just like, which one in this section will I take? Because I don't want to play this game with these people. <laughs> Also, I got in trouble like right after he sat down because typically in a show, like it's theater etiquette, you can't take photos of the show. That's understood. But usually they have no problem with you taking a picture like of your playbill in front of the curtain or the stage. Well, this had no curtain, but like I've been to shows where it's just a, there's no curtain. You, you, you can see the stage and they don't usually have any issue with it. But I held up my program, I lifted my phone, and within like a second, there was somebody there saying like, no photos inside, like whatsoever, period. <laughs> Which I think is really funny because they filmed the whole thing. Um, yeah. And But uh, the only thing I can think of for why is it must have something to do with the illusion where the, the displays disappear at the end. Because um, literally when you're sitting down, you're just looking at the wall of those displays. Like there's mm -hmm. the displays, there's a table, there's a chair. And like, that's it. So that was interesting. But yeah, so uh, the elephant in the room is I ended up being the elephant in the show. Oh. Uh, which was very alarming. <laughs> <laughs> so it ended. I ended up getting a letter from my mom uh, live on stage. <laughs> and Wow, like, okay. Wow, this opens up a whole uh, yeah, new awesome. area of questions for me to ask you. <laughs> Yeah, because so and what was like, this was not long after we got married. And so and like I talk to my mom every day. So I am pretty sure that my response was not what the Rulatista was looking for. Because I didn't get overwhelmingly emotional about it. And yeah. like seeing seeing the movie version of the show, I can see what he was expecting people to do with their letters and I didn't cry. <laughs> I was dumbfounded. Like I had this moment of like disbelief, like how is this happening? Why is this here? Why do you have this? But, um, you know, I didn't cry and he was, so he does that thing where he like puts his hand on your back and he's like, do you need, if you need anything, I'm right over here. And he came back. He's like, are you sure you don't need anything? I was like, I'm fine. <laughs> like I want to get off the stage and, and <laughs> <in> a hole. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so cool, I'm going to follow that up then and ask you, did you ask your mom how that came to be? Yeah. And yeah. are you allowed to tell us? <laughs> I, I was not asked to sign any kind of an NDA, um, but Benji probably has a better better version of the event than I can recount. <laughs> okay. So I wasn't going to like say, the reason I didn't care what card I picked was because I was so nervous about this going down. Right. Uh, like they called me. So should we say like this is all spoilers? Oh yeah. Right well, now, okay. Maybe we that's... should save this. Can we can we so... pocket this and like do a little Derek Delgadio and bring it back up at the end and like reveal sure the mystery? Sure. And anybody right. watching who hasn't seen it in and of itself, like this isn't the way to spoil it for yourself. So this will live yeah. forever on YouTube. Um, go watch it and then yeah. yes. Oh, okay. Let's. Sorry, I don't mean to like commandeer this whole thing, but we should start yeah. by trying to just describe what this show is for those who haven't seen it right so we kind of 
talked about how it's to me it's kind of half I, I described it to my friend who has a similar taste in movies and stuff and entertainment to me I, I said it was half Spalding Gray and half Ricky J and if you know if you know entertainment and you know performers and especially people who have had like one person shows like this Spalding Gray is a monologist he had a, a few movies come out about his work um I'm very famous as far as like monologists goes. He's just a guy who sits at a table and tells uh, a 90 minute story about his life. And that's the movie, you know, or that was the show when he was doing it off Broadway or on Broadway or whatever. And then Ricky Jay is a, one of the most talented magicians of the past 50 years who had one man shows on Broadway where he would throw playing cards into watermelons and, and just use cards. One of them was called Ricky Jay and his 52 assistants. And it was just different ways that he can manipulate playing cards and stuff. So this show to me combined both of those ideas and and he uses magic to tell, like you said, uh, a very personal story about his life. And he uses <clears throat> illusions every once in a while to kind of punctuate those moments and get across the ideas that he's trying to, get across yeah and in in the uh they did a 92nd street y event um and when they asked derek to describe his own show because they all he frank oz stephen colbert all all admitted they find it very hard to explain what the show is he referred to it as just a theatrical existential crisis <laughs> uh, to me it's just asking the the big unanswerable question who are you and mm -hmm. like all the infinite uh words that can be used to describe you and you know in the end nobody is just one thing and that's kind of the end of the show anyway is he is you know a son uh uh, uh like all these things a friend blah 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 and then the relatista mm -hmm. is that ben, all <laughs> you guys have any how would you describe um, yeah so i would probably take what both of you said it's it really is a show about who is anyone, but using magic to help get that point across um, with all these different stories. And I got, I don't normally get um, corrections. Benji looks like he's either busy or frozen. Uh, no. <laughs> I'm, I had I'm, in, I'm learning. I had in my review um, written the word magician. And then that was like the one feedback was, can you change that to illusionist? Um, mm. but then, during the 92nd Street Y event, Stephen Colbert referred to him as a magician and he didn't correct him. So. See, I would say like, it's less, it's less about the magic. I mean, he uses the magic to get the point across, which is incredible what he does. Yeah. Um, but it's more about how to use that magic to take it to that next level. Mm -hmm. And there are, I mean, there are some really cool, uh, moments in the show as oh, well yes. uh, in terms of illusions. Hello, Eric. Thanks for watching. Uh, so I wasn't familiar with Del Derek Delgadio before I went into this. And I, I feel like I watch a lot of magic. Like, I've been, like, casually tuned into the magic world my whole life. But I don't I don't know Derek. Maybe I have seen it before. Maybe I've seen him pop up here and there. But it didn't it didn't register for me until, like, I didn't really knew, know who he was until this. Did you guys know him already? I didn't, but I at least knew that his name must mean something at least in New York because his sh his name is in the title. <laughs> right, like, right. We have it written really well, just in and of itself, just for brevity. But the official title of the show and the film is Derek Delgadio's in and of itself. Yeah. Oh, Eric is a magician. Nice. There we go. I wonder if he, if he belongs to yeah <laughs> to uh, the. Uh, what's it called? The the Gothic Castle from the Magic Castle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's um he he was he was named their Magician of the Year. Some I, I don't know what year, but I was in my research. I discovered that. <laughs> but um, it's to me, this is one of those things that it's almost a shame that it can't be promoted more widely, just because of. COVID and everything because it's it's such a neat escape for like it's it you know it deals with being you know it's not like frivolous and you know it deals with identity and things like that that you know aren't I don't would say simple are simple but it's just by by taking a complex concept such as who you are 
but adding some magic to it, you know, or illusion to it, or whatever you want to call it, um, it just kind of takes a little bit of the edge off of these things, and it makes it a lot more accessible, which I think is, it was a neat thing about seeing it. It's a neat, you know, the whole time I'm watching the movie, I kind of felt like bad that people couldn't see it in person. Like, you know, obviously seeing it, seeing illusion in person is much better than seeing it on film. But, mm -hmm. uh, but they, I mean, I will say, having seen the show in person and having seen the filmed version, it's still astounding. Like you, they don't use visual effects in the film pretty much at all. So you can like, it just breeds that, it breathes that um, air of authenticity that everything you're seeing really happened. And it happened over the course of 700 and some performances, presumably all went off without a hitch um, between New York <laughs> and the pre-New York LA thing. The other thing that was cool that they, they don't talk about in the film, but they have the book that he, he always asked for a Mr. or Mrs. Tomorrow yeah. um, to take the book. I, I wanna know what happened on the very last night, like closing night in New York, um, but they didn't allow for questions during that 92nd Street Y event. But I guess when the show moved from LA to New York, the Mr. Tomorrow or that they got, they had to agree to fly to New York, like <laughs> to, to bring the book. <laughs> That's to, awesome. To the premiere in New York. So that is cool too. I love that log and it's such okay, a cool, cool idea those, just to yeah just to explain yeah, like all that. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's really neat. So the, um, the animated parts of the movie, you guys didn't see those on like monitors or anything during the show, did you? No, no, so the the theater was so small that you didn't need it. Like it was a very intimate space. Um like the back row, I'm trying to think like what's what's even a comparable distance it'd be like from the castle at disneyland to the partner statue like that's as far away as you'd be so like if the philharmonic is like right in front of the castle you can see all their faces clearly yeah. so there was no need for like screens or blown up um, right but the the animations that they created to oh, illustrate the stories that you didn't those see were them. added for the film you're right okay. i forgot about i forgot about that but yes so storytelling wise for the movie they've added uh illustrations, animations, and even like filmed men smoking silhouettes for the the Rulatista, um right. story. So yeah, they do they do bring those anecdotes to life with some separate recorded um, items, but uh, they are, um, it, it, the movie itself, like everything you see happen on the stage happened. And, and I think that was a good choice because in the, when you're seeing it in person, there's, I would say like a tension, right? Cause you're not quite sure where you're going. You're very uncomfortable because you know you don't know what's happening here, yeah. um, and that. But you know, so you're just watching. You're so engaged on his face, you know, on his storytelling, um, which is part part of you know how that magic happens. But you know, when you're watching on a movie, you don't want to look at some guy for <laughs> two hours. So, you know, it 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 kind of creates a different ethereal vibe in the movie because it has this sort of limited animation kind of. Um, mystery to it but in person it, you're just it, it it's you know your 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 stomach is clenched the whole time because you just have no idea what's happening it's not like a david copperfield show where it's just like woo, woo. Right. You know, i mean you're just like the intensity can't be sort of overstated and they it, did do like you see it a little bit like the ruletista mechanical man would occasionally come to life during the show um, that was about the most like of a visual aid beyond what Derek was doing that you had. Right. Yeah. Not knowing that there was magic involved. I think the first uh, illusion that he does is the, the little paper ship in the bottle thing. Yeah. And I just, when that happened, I just thought, Oh, okay. That's just kind of a neat little illusion. I didn't think he was going to be building on, you know, having increasingly more impressive uh, magic stuff happening throughout the show. So that was, a, a good reveal. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's what's interesting is because you go, I mean, if you go into it thinking, I don't say magic, but you know, there's going to be elements of that. It takes a while to get there. And like, so for the first 20 minutes, you're just like, what's happening? What's, where's the illusion going to come? There's no big set pieces. There's no, you know, there's, it, it's, it's, you know, it's sort of this weird combination of like big concept illusion with close up magic and then the big illusion at the end. Um, so it's, but 
is in in many you know it's there to tell a story. It's a very Disney in its the execution. I think you know. I mean, not mm-hmm. you know, fun and magical, but you know the illu- the illusions are there to service what he's trying to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like it's like Disney's approach to musical storytelling, where the songs always move the story forward. Here, are the illusions always move the story forward, except for that big one at the end, which just crumbles everything down and makes you question life. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, For one of the animations, for the one where they're doing the animation with the card tricks, Mm -hmm. was he just describing it on stage? Yeah, yeah, he was just there with the cards, like talking about them. I think he would like occasionally like switch switch hands, do that thing where you like xylophone them into the other hand. (laughs) I can't. Yeah, because I was thinking like the animation for that one, it had different voiceovers and stuff like that. So I didn't know Yeah, he was like doing. Those were the expanded moments. And then obviously parts of the film are kind of Frankenstein from multiple performances, like when it goes into montages, um, especially for like the people with their letters Um, or as he's moving through the audience at the end, there are moments where it cuts and you can tell like the people on the left side of the theater like are a different audience. Yeah. Uh, But I mean, that was cool. I mean, during our show, I'm I'm imagining he's gotten every single one 100% correct. They did have voiceover like, when he okay. calls him, calls his friend, like that mm-hmm. was actually that you know they would play it over the speakers. But this is interesting. Yeah. Eric is talking about uh, experience in a small in Louisville where the magic show, uh, where everyone was blindfolded for the whole show. That sounds really cool. I, I feel wow. like Eric, you know, <laughs> like upcoming magic shows. I should well didn't, not right now, but didn't Drew Carey do that? Hmm. Didn't Drew Carey do that? I'm just joking. It sounds dangerous, joke. <laughs> if you don't know what that is, Eric, it was a really bad attraction at Disney's Hollywood Studios, um, starring Drew Carey, where you had to wear headphones and like the screen would go dark, and then it was like someone was cutting your hair, and it would switch from left to right ear. Um, it was really playing uh, a big deal with stereo sound um, in like the '90s. <laughs> I don't know if I would trust a magic show where I was blindfolded the entire time. <laughs> yeah. True. That does sound cool. Yeah. I, I what was, was each of your uh, favorite segments of the movie? Like when it breaks down into the six different things. Uh, mine is not the elephant thing because of uh, <laughs> because of being the elephant. Um, it just like even watching it on the film, like I kind of relived some trauma. <laughs> uh, just like because like you watch the people's faces as he calls, like I'm looking for so and so, and like you just see like the color disappear. And they're like, "What is happening?" And that was me. Um, <laughs> Uh, I I would say I really like the Rulatista. I know the actual box itself isn't that. Um, I mean, the Mechanical Man is cool, but uh, mm-hmm. it's probably the least interesting of the illusions. But I think that story is it's so central to the whole show, um, and it's the one that stays with me the most. Like if I'm thinking about one of those boxes, the Rulatista is the one I think of first. I just liked watching him play with those cards. Uh, the The whole segment where he's dealing dealing out the kings and aces. That's yeah. And and I, I read a little after that. I watched the show. I went back and because I always trust Penn Jillette, uh, uh for my magic opinions, you know. And I read what he had to say after he saw the show, and he was like, "Yeah, that's that's not magic. That's just skill." And I think that's what's so impressive about it is that it is just skill. There's no trick involved there you know um it's just memorization and dexterity really and practice well and i think he's using that same skill somehow with the how he knows who is is that's exactly what i said to my wife after we i was like he he's telling you how he does that when he does the card thing uh that kind of memorization and stuff. Yeah, that's it's so pretty what's crazy is he goes through like a whole 90 minute show of like remembering other stuff and then comes to you and knows like somehow yeah. probably through a camera backstage or something, which card you picked. It, is, it is very impressive. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No. And it was it. The card bit was almost like a, an intermission because there's something sort of comforting about seeing a card trick in a show like this, because yeah. you, you just had this, like, you know, the, the people who are being sent away, you have all this other stuff. And then it's like, okay, you know, basic card. I mean, not, you know, it's not basic, but you have sort of this little less intense moment. And it's like, okay, I can breathe. And then, you know, obviously everything right. comes 
kind of takes a step back. Yeah, there's just something so pure about like that's the part that I want to go back and rewatch like right away. I'll probably go and watch the whole thing eventually, but I would just want to revisit like just watching him shuffle those cards and deal out those cards again because that's it's so impressive to watch. Yeah, and then well, and he he does the little house around the gold brick. So on our walk back, we we went to the intersection and it was gone. And I think someone took it. <laughs> yeah, they must have. And that is actually how Stephen Colbert like be- became in touch with him. Was uh, Derek followed Stephen Colbert on Twitter? Stephen Colbert went to see the show. Then he went to look for the big brick, and it wasn't there. And because Derek followed him, he could DM him back. So he DM'd him and was like, "The brick's not there. What gives?" And then Derek <laughs> back like, "Oh yeah, that happens sometimes." And then they ended up meeting up for drinks <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> He ended up being a producer on the film version, which is cool. That's awesome. Huh? Uh, the other, the other square I would say that in the movie resonated with me more was the window with the glass, mm. with the glass with the bullet, particularly because in the end his mom is there. Yeah, so going through the audience, he says, "Mom." I love that part. Uh, yeah, so I think I mean it was. It's obviously a powerful story in and of itself, but a bunch. But. Um, I think in the film, having the mom, you know, in the audience at the end uh, really kind of made that one stand out a lot more. I think Eric, that's one of the parts. I was going to say, Eric is here mark, mocking us, saying, you know, how we have no idea how magic works, which is true. <laughs> it's very true. Uh, yeah. It's very true. I won't I, pretend I, to. I will say I was, my first magic show ever was Lance Burton as a kid at, in, in Las Vegas. And coming out of that show, I went to the gift shop and I bought my little Lance Burton kit and I could do the cup and the balls and I could do the magic coloring book. Benji can do the disappearing finger. But because of the Lance Burton thing and then they did some television specials in the 90s, him and Belinda, the woman of first woman of magic, which was his wife at the time. Um, and then the magic revealed the masked magician thing. Like I was super into all of those. So I feel like I understand a lot of the illusions, plus Arrested Development, and Job is, is among my favorite characters. Illusions, Michael. <laughs> my, uh, what was his, his like tomb of whatever, where like Buster rolls down in the back. <laughs> a little off topic, but did you see the episode of Earth to Ned with uh, Penn and Teller? Yes. That's... I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, that's a good one. They do the, the cup and balls with the invisible cups. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. That is not how my trick worked. <laughs> go watch leonard green okay well i google leonard green uh you guys yeah. keep talking oh uh, i i want to talk about the uh the celebrities in the audience who kept popping up the first one that i noticed yeah. was was brian henson of the jim henson company mm. and and he's like right in the very front he's like leaning forward very intensely paying attention i was like okay it makes sense with the frank oz connection and everything but then like you got bill gates in there you had <laughs> Tim Gunn, I saw. Uh, yeah. Who else? There was a few others. Now I'm blanking on on who else I saw. Um, it's like Easter eggs. You probably just need to like yeah. go through the movie and pause every audience shot and like check everyone's face. Right, right. <laughs> I don't remember who else was in there, but there there are like half a dozen recognizable celebrities in the audience through that. I mean, there, I'm sure it's several different uh, performances cut together, or like maybe a dozen different performances cut together. But mm-hmm. yeah, keep your eyes open for them. David Blaine. Yeah, David Blaine was yeah. there. Yeah. <clears throat> nice. Well, going back to Magic, you've you've played uh, Blackjack with Chris Angel. They did. <laughs> <laughs> Why would they ever let a magician play Blackjack? It just seems very dangerous. He, it was uh, it was not um, the casino did okay. <laughs> okay. He had one of those fake mustaches on. <laughs> No, I think because Benji's not the kind of guy who would like recognize Chris Angel. I think he, I think he introduced himself, like, "Hey, I'm Chris Angel." Didn't he? <laughs> he, he, had, he, he no, I'm not gonna get to that story. <laughs> but, um, yeah, in and of itself. <laughs> anything else about the film that you guys wanted to talk about? We've reached our normal end of time for a non-Tony hosted show. Well, I think we got to go back now and get the story yeah. about the letter. Oh yeah. So Ben, you want to so spoilers? Yeah. So, so I feel like like his people are going to come and assassinate me or something. The, um, well, did you have to sign anything? Because I I was never asked to sign anything saying I wouldn't talk about it. I don't think so. They called me. Yeah. 
Um, and then, you know, we emailed back and forth, but I don't, I was just going through my email to make sure like I didn't sign anything, but it doesn't look like it. Um, I didn't. <laughs> um, and if my mom did, she did a really bad job of remembering that she did. <laughs> so, um, you know, I bought the tickets and I got a phone call from them, the you know, and they said, you know, are you going with somebody? And I said, yeah, that's why I bought two tickets. And, you know, they asked, is there someone who could write a letter uh, that would mean something to, you know, the person I was going with? And I thought really long and hard about, like, who that could possibly be. And um, I settled on Alex's mom, who it took several tries to get her to write the letter. And then they sent it in. And I don't know how Alex picked that letter. I don't know how they knew who Alex was. I mean, maybe because you're know, what he picked, you know, in terms of a card. But um, well, I'm assuming it's all the same letters, just all in well, there. So one of the things it's not, I don't think it is because, right, because oh, they all had different right? return addresses. Yeah. Right? Well, no, it's well, it's not even that. Like because the the envelope, the addresses were all blurred out. Like like they had taken a sharpie to the return addresses. So in terms of like the letters that I had in my hand, I could not see the return addresses. Like I couldn't see and know like oh this one's from my mom. On the back of them, lightly in in pencil, it had like the name of like a relative, and the one that I picked out was the only one in the stack that said mom. Oh, okay. The other ones. But I will say the reason I picked the one that I picked, and he was shocked that I picked it so fast, was all of them were white envelopes, except this one was um, a seafoam blue or seafoam mm -hmm. green, like a Tiffany blue. And that was the accent color from our wedding. Mm -hmm. And the wedding had only been like a month prior. And so when I picked it, he was like, wow, you picked that really fast. Like, he looked suspicious of me. And I was like, well, the color speaks to me. <laughs> and, um, but I, you see in the film, like, people with just white envelopes and picking, yeah. somehow matching the right one. So that I don't know. I don't know how the people end up getting the right envelope. For me, it wasn't even a question because it, the envelope was a color that resonated with me. All right, but, Eric, um, Eric, you're just being a jerk now. Eric is, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I did. I mean, you know, I opened the letter. It was, you know, my mom just saying, you know, kind of how much she loves me. And uh, it, it asked, like, I think her assignment from when I talked to her was like she had to include um, something that like she thought I would be emotional over, which I'm usually pretty unfazed in life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um movies make me cry but like real life situations usually don't until i really reflect on them because i'm just broken inside so, <laughs> um, so like i got it and like you know i'm reading through it and then i had to read it to the audience and i was dumbfounded i was in disbelief but i didn't cry and um so i felt like this whole elephant thing also i'm sitting in the chair thinking like how the hell am i going to turn into an elephant like where <laughs> are my favorite animal and i was like where are they i want to want to meet this elephant. oh my god <laughs> i was yeah. expecting there to be an a literal elephant uh, yeah but from what he was saying yep well and so i'm there and i'm so nervous that i'm gonna screw this up like i won't not that i don't know what i could have possibly done to screw this up but i'm like Make sure we're sitting in the right seats. Not that we were like, they told me to have him sit there or there. And I'm just like, um, yeah, I was just like, so until Alex went up on stage, I was like, my stomach was just in knots. Cause I, I was like, he, is he going to kill me? Cause I don't know what was going to happen with the letter. Like He's I didn't know <laughs> what the trick was. Right. I just knew they asked to send in a letter and I was told not to tell Alex. Yeah, even but even knowing what you know, it's pretty incredible because there's so much that could go wrong. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, what if he couldn't show up? There's so many variables. Yeah, exactly. Well, like and on top of that, so during the 92nd Street Y event, um, I mean, Stephen Colbert mentioned it, it like he gets a heart attack in the show watching him give the book away because yeah. that 
that's a big unknown variable. Yes. You don't know if something's going to happen and that person can't get back the other night. You don't know if that person's going to be real shady and just take the book. Yes. And yeah. fear. Um, you know, and, uh, but he did in that, like one of the best parts about that 92nd street Y event. I know Mike, you asked if it's available anywhere and I, I would, I, I wish it was, I don't know that it is, but he did like bring the book up, like show and tell and kind of go through some of his favorite stories from it. And there were some incredible stories in there. Just like what people did with it was art in and of itself. But I'm bunch. Yeah. Well, and I, I wasn't going to tell Alex because like, then his mom like spilled the beans. Like when he called like right <laughs> after the show. I was like, yeah, I called, I'm like not going to ruin when we got outside. Like, What's that? Uh, yeah, the first how, thing I did when we got on the street was I called my mom. <laughs> like, how could you not? Yeah, I would immediately like, demand to know yeah. how that happened. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And then I was because Alex had like zero emotional reaction. I was like, oh, they're gonna think I told him. <laughs> and, but you so, didn't. I promise you didn't. I'm just broken. <laughs> <laughs> but you cried at Titanic. Um, I cried. <laughs> Titanic 3D, like that third dimension. I needed, <laughs> I needed the whole ending credits to compose myself before I could go back into public. Now I will say, um, Derek does have a book coming out. Uh, yes. In sold uh, March, um, called Amoral Man: a True Story and Other Lies by Derek Delgadio. Amoral. <laughs> I already got it. Uh, waiting on my Kindle. <laughs> so I, I will get that and read it and enjoy it i'm sure yeah. but um and and uh, just frank oz as a director you know uh has had a great career and and so many wonderful comedies and stuff and he made before this the muppet guys talking documentary and no yeah this pretty pretty good yeah it makes me want to watch three rotten scoundrels <laughs> Little Shop of Horrors. Mm -hmm. Didn't he do In and Out? Yep. That's a really now good it's one. in and of. <laughs> now it's in and of itself, but oh, <laughs> uh, I love this movie. Yeah. <laughs> it was a good time. I thought it was awesome. One of the one of the best things on Hulu. I do wish I was able to see it in person, but at the same time, I do love how they were able to add multiple things to the Hulu special. So like you saw the multiple people going up for the reading and everything like that, where if you saw it in person, you would only see one person doing it and it may not be the reaction you wanted, like we were mm -hmm. talking about. But with this one, you got five different reactions that are awesome. Yep. Um, so I thought that was really cool, especially with the audience at the ends. I'm curious well, to see I, what he did. That's what I was just about to say. You read my mind. Like now, now that this is out there in film form, um, and, and, and it's reaching a much bigger audience than it as a show actually could. I'm really curious to see what his next theatrical space um, performance ends up being. Uh, you know, I want to say, too, I, I hate social media so much, but this is one of those things where it does seem like it's helping get the word out about mm -hmm. something like this, where I feel like it would probably fly completely under the radar if not for people talking about it on Twitter and... And in these, like, you know, one out of a hundred scenarios like this, it feels like it's worth it for just for that reason to have that word spread. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like what Twitter used to be before people got. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. yeah, I really hope it does well because it's such an incredible experience. Yeah, I was I was going to kind of because who had another original ish show? Uh, si uh, the, sis the sister? The sister well, is yeah, just came on Hulu. Yeah, so they had two originals at the same time, which is, you know, not normal for them. So I was kind of bummed that it wasn't the first. I mean, I don't know if it, you know, what Hulu does to determine what it recommends, but when I popped up on Friday, I was promoting the other show. When I think this is probably the better experience. Yeah, yeah this I was gonna say like, probably like, has more mass appeal though. I mean, it, the sister is a drama. It's just four episodes. Um, but, but this is, I mean, this is special. I don't know how it showed up to you, Mike, but for me, when I logged into Hulu, it was nowhere. I had to search for it. I want to say it was one of the f the featured uh, okay. media on there when I logged in. I could be yeah. wrong. 
Um, to wrap it up, my question, since Benji doesn't remember what he picked, um, for Mike and Lee, if you could pick a word, and it doesn't have to be confined by what was available to audience members, what would your IM have been? Boy, that's tricky. Lee, go first. Multiple words. <laughs> I probably would have picked Joker. Mm. I like to make people laugh, and I just... You are like taking good. things seriously. I think one of the ones I saw in there was skeptic, and I probably would have picked that. Mm. Yeah, I would have picked I, Superman, so I could go. I am, I am, I am Superman, and I can <laughs> do anything. Wow. <laughs> the uh, the skeptic too was at, when he's calling people by name, like his face, like the disbelief when it happened. Like you could tell he was like suddenly maybe a believer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he had some good. I'm sure he did that every night. He had little jokes for each one, or the uh, the introvert. I'm sorry, I made you stand up. That was yeah, awesome. that was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Well, thank you um, so much for everybody for watching. Uh, Eric is uh, compassionate. Good to know. Uh, thank you, especially Eric, for for tuning in and uh, participating in our comments. We appreciate that. Thank you, Eric. We'll be back next Monday. Did you have something to say, Benny? I was going to plug the next week. Oh yeah, so next Monday, uh, same time, 7.30 p.m. Pacific, we will be back for Laughing Place Movie Club with Mary Poppins Returns. I'll be there. I don't know who will be joining me, um, but that's going to be fun and exciting. Anything else we want to plug for uh, YouTube this week, Benji? Just tomorrow's going to be nuts. So uh, <laughs> at 9 o'clock, Jeremiah will be at Disney Hollywood Studios. Oh, I, well, go to the website. I don't know if I can tell you what's going to be there, but at 6 o'clock, we're going to have a cool feature story. At nine o'clock, uh, we will have um, Mike at Disney's Hollywood Studios. At eleven o'clock, no, I'm sorry, Jeremiah at Disney's Hollywood Studios. At eleven o'clock, Mike at Downtown Disney. He'll be and eating at, stuff there. What's that? Yeah, he, he can eat. I, I can. And, then, <laughs> and then four o'clock, we've got Barely Necessities, and at seven thirty, trivia. Cool. So, Big full day tomorrow on laughingplace.go.com. Or maybe not. .go. .go. <laughs> oh, please don't give the wrong address. <laughs> uh, oh, no. We wish we were part of the Go Network. The hub. Dot, um, so, yeah. So, thanks so much. Thanks, guys. This was a fun movie to talk about. Yeah. I love this yeah. movie. Please go see it. It's yeah, on watch it, watch it if you haven't already. It, and you know, really, none of yeah. what we said spoils it, even though I said you got to watch it without knowing about it. You, you can still go and enjoy it for sure. Go to your couch on Hulu. Spread the word about this. Spread the word about Earth to Ned. Spread, you know, it's there's so much content out there. If you like it and you want to see more of it or that kind of thing, just make sure you tell other people about it because there's, there's so much out there that it gets lost in the shuffle sometimes. It's not just the Mandalorian and Wanda vision. Right. In the words of Ron Howard, tell your friends about our show. Well, I, I've been on a kick about uh, trying to broaden people's horizons since I saw Eric Idle referred to as the guy from Journey into Imagination. Yeah. It's like, wait a minute. That's it, a, barely a footnote in that man's he, career. He doesn't even have that animated little bleep. <laughs> Money Python on Peacock. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. <laughs>